Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I want to recommend some of my favourite 20th century dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction to you. Now I'm doing this because next week uh, on Monday is the start of End of the World Week, which is the readathon I'm hosting all about 20th century dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction. And if you want to know more about that, I will link the announcement video in the description box. But today I really just want to tell you about eight particular works of 20th century fiction that I really enjoy in those genres. All of the works of fiction that I'm going to talk about are linked in the description box where you will also find timestamps. So if you're only interested in uh, one or two recommendations from this video, you can have a look at the description box and click on the timestamp and that will take you to that, exactly that place in the video where I talk about that specific book. And because I can't think of a better way, I've organized them in chronological order of publication date. So the first story I want to recommend, because this is in fact not a novel, is E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops, which is a short story published in 1909. And this is definitely one of the more unusual dystopian stories that I have read. Um, it's, it's a one sitting read, so I can really recommend it if you are after something short and dystopian to read. This is the story of a middle-aged woman named Vashti. She lives in a cell in the depth of the machine that pretty much spans the entire globe. All of humanity is living underground in these connected cells, but uh, they are essentially, every single person is essentially to use a modern term, self-isolating within uh, their own cell. Um, but all of the cells are connected and the machine pretty much runs everyone's lives. So um, Vashti is very used to her routine and the machine provides everything that she needs and she's quite happy in this system. Now the reason why everyone is living in, the, in this gigantic honeycomb structure underground is because the earth is too poisonous uh, to live on, the air is too poisonous to breathe. Um, I personally found the sort of uh, climate change implications of this very interesting considering this was written over a hundred years ago. Anyway, uh, Vashti is quite happy with her life but uh, she is a bit worried about her adult son who lives on the other side of the planet in his own little cell. Um, the problem she has with him is that he's very rebellious. His name is Kuno and he claims to have seen the surface of the earth uh, he's convinced there are people there. He convinced the machine is lying to all of them. Super interesting setup. It's Ian Forster, so the prose is just beautiful. And it's so interesting to read something from an author whose novels take a completely different direction with a completely different setting. Uh, it's interesting to see how many tropes of dystopian fiction we can already find in this very, very early work of the genre, and I can really recommend the story to you. Next up, I'm going to talk about one of the great works of 20th century dystopian fiction that you'll all have heard of, and that I have spoken about on this channel many, many times, and that is 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, this novel was published in 1949. It is possibly the best known 20th century dystopia and it is about a man named Winston Smith who lives in a totalitarian society where every move of his and of his countrymen is watched by the government itself through sophisticated machinery and um, well and, and a culture of oppression the government knows everything you are doing in this novel truth and reality become political tools. Uh, the rewriting of history, the rewriting of the present, the repackaging of truths into lies that are then sold as truths is, is a big theme in this novel. And it is, I think, the reason why it resonated so much with me when I first read it. It's an incredibly iconic work of fiction. It's fantastically written. It is terrifyingly accurate and if you haven't read 1984 now maybe this is your maybe this is your chance to pick it up and read it and learn from it it certainly made a big impression on me we move on to a kind of more fun piece of post-apocalyptic fiction 
but also of course very terrifying and that is The Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. This is from 1951 and it is a post-apocalyptic kind of adventure novel uh, which features one of my favorite tropes, the killer plant. Our main character is a scientist named Bill and at the beginning of the novel he wakes up in a hospital and then realizes that everyone around him has gone suddenly blind but he can still see. So he makes his way through London where he quite literally watches society fall apart around him. Uh, he also notices that the triffids, which are these kind of tame plants that uh, people in England and all around the world have been using as garden plants or as uh, farm crops, these triffids, these plants, are suddenly on the move and have started to attack people. So Bill meets a woman named Gisela, also one of the few people who can still see, and together they have to fight for survival in this new and scary world. I thought the tone of this was quite engaging, quite fun. I really enjoyed the female main character, Gisela. It's, a, it's got a bit of action going on, uh, but it's also incredibly of its time, uh, which I really enjoyed. So. Uh, definitely one to give a go as well. Next up, um, from 1954, I want to recommend to you I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. This is a novella, it's quite a short book, um, maybe not quite a one-sitting read unless you have more stamina than I do when it comes to reading, but uh, still under 200 pages. And this story uh, focuses on a man named Robert, who is the last survivor of a zombie vampire apocalypse. Um, a bacteria has turned all of humanity into these terrifying creatures that come out at night and drink blood and kill people. This is set a few months after this um, pandemic and Robert is all by himself, he locks himself, he in his house, he barricades himself in his house every single night to survive the night. And then by day, when the zombie vampires are dormant, he goes out and kills them. Uh, at the same time, he also tries to work on a cure for this disease and he tries to find some other living soul so that he isn't all by himself. If the Day of the Triffids was the fun side of mid-century post-apocalyptic fiction. This is definitely the dark side. This is scary, it's gory, it's gruesome, um, but it is still a fantastic read and very engaging. Let's skip ahead to 1985 where we find another iconic work in 20th century dystopian fiction, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. This is set in a near future America where people have become infertile and the birth rate has fallen drastically. An ultra religious government has taken over and has created a society that is essentially built on the suppression of women. Women are blamed for the infertility of humanity and they have to suffer the consequences. The main character is a woman named Offred, who, who's one of the few women uh, that are still fertile. Therefore, she is forced to live with a rich couple of the upper classes and uh, work as their handmaid, meaning that her only function is to be raped by the man of the house on regular intervals in order to get pregnant and bear them a child. This is one of the bleakest dystopias that I've ever read uh, and one of the most powerfully written and I can recommend it if you have the constitution for it. It wasn't a fun read. Uh, even, even reading 1984 I sometimes felt like I was enjoying myself. Certainly was not enjoying myself reading The Handmaid's Tale but it the, the power of the book is undeniable and if you haven't read it and if you feel up for that kind of a world and that kind of a story, then give it a go. It is worth it. It is worth it in the end. My next recommendation is from 1992 and it is The Children of Men by P.D. James. This is actually kind of a similar setup to The Handmaid's Tale, uh, where um, the human race has become infertile, but um, there are no births at all, there are no pregnancies at all. In fact, the youngest generation 
of people is just about 17 years old. So no one's given birth for 17 years. It is also set in the near future. In fact, I think it might be set in the year 2021. So not far from now. And the population is aging and very slowly going crazy about it. The main character is an Oxford academic named Theo. And as the world gets slowly more desperate and mad and longing for children, uh, the government is using this opportunity to take more control, to become stronger, to become more controlling of society. Theo falls in with a group of rebels who are on the one hand kind of trying to overthrow the government, uh, although they are quite a small group of people, but mostly they are trying to inform their fellow citizens about the loss of liberties that is happening right under their noses. This book starts quite slow, quite introverted, quite thoughtful, and then very rapidly uh, develops into a very action-packed novel, especially the last half, well, the last third is, is, is rather violent and quick and a lot happens in it. So I think it's a weirdly balanced book. It's, it feels a bit off when you read it, but it is still an incredibly interesting and engaging story. And it has a lot of things that make you think. Uh, it, it takes a bit of a, I guess, a religious angle on, on this whole dystopian idea, which I found very interesting. Sticking with the early 90s, from 1993, we have Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. This is set in a near future America, where the government is essentially non-existent because society has almost completely collapsed. Uh, the main character, Lauren, is a teenage girl uh, who's writing her diary. And in fact, this is a diary style novel. She is stuck in this suburban cul-de-sac with her immediate family and a handful of other families who have essentially barricaded themselves in their little street. They've put up walls which they defend um, and they use that to keep their families safe from the chaos and violence outside of this tiny little side street. Uh, Lauren though, she feels called to something more. Uh, she is low-key developing her own religion and her own spirituality, but she's really driven to the limit of her abilities when uh, suddenly everything changes and Lauren is kind of ripped from her little safe community and suddenly she has to survive with really nothing but her own skills and her own growing charisma. Really gorgeous novel. Mm, it's, it's one of my favorite ever dystopian novels that I've read. My final recommendation is also from 1993 and it is The Giver by Lois Lowry. This is another very short read, under 200 pages, and it is probably my favorite young adult dystopian. And, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's also the first young adult dystopian novel. It really sets a lot of the tropes and the archetypes and the ideas that we later see in hugely popular young adult dystopian fiction like The Hunger Games. Uh, this story's main character is Jonas, who's just turned 12, and he lives in a very peaceful, very safe, very economically sensible, very ecologically sensible world. He lives in this little community that controls every aspect of his life and that of his friends and that of his family, but everyone's happy, everyone's well looked after. At the age of 12, every child in this community gets assigned their future occupation through a special ceremony. So they don't get to pick their jobs, but they get assigned positions. And Jonas is assigned the position of the receiver of memory, which really singles him out among his friends because it is so unlike any other job that the community um, needs. So he goes into training with a mysterious man called the giver of memory and through him he finds out the dark secrets behind his happy little peaceful society. This novel is absolutely gorgeous, it is groundbreaking in its genre, it is short, it is sweet, but it has a lot of substance. It holds up to a third, fourth, fifth reread. Uh, it's really an underrated 
dystopian novel of the 20th century and if you have an extra two three hours to squeeze that in then I would highly recommend you do so. It is a short read but it certainly packs a punch. And there you go, those were my eight recommendations for 20th century dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction. Put your recommendations in the comments down below. I am still looking for uh, my TBR. I still haven't decided what I am going to read next week in end of the world week. So uh, I'll, I'll gladly read through all of your recommendations for 20th century dystopian and post-apocalyptic fiction. Thank you for watching. Bye.